Hello, Tante Etlanate Ani Bonjour. Welcome back to our shared politics. My name is Nova. I am a settler on Turtle Island. I created this podcast to really showcase socialism instead of just pursuing the Red Scare blindly, which just pushes people further apart. I wish to express acknowledgement that I am on Treaty 8 territory, home to the Tetskane, Deneza, Nahiawak, Soto, and BC Metis. It is essential I recognize all First Nations, Metis, and Inuit, both status and non status, as the guardians of these lands. As a non Indigenous person, I play a role as a treaty partner with being represented by the government. My pronouns are she, her, but I also accept they, them, and I fall under the 2S LGBTQIA plus umbrella. I say these things at the top of every episode so that you are able to make your decision on how safe of a person I am. Last week, I went on a little rant about land leeches as I was still in the middle of reading the book about the topic I'd like to discuss today. Beginning today, but this will probably begin be an ongoing discussion forever. The book I've read from my local public library is called The Ku Klux Klan in Canada, A Century of Promoting Racism and Hate in the Peaceable Kingdom. To discuss the KKK in Canada, we need to begin by discussing where the KKK came from after the Confederates lost the Civil War and how it was revamped in 1915 with a moving picture, one of the largest box office successes to date. Okay, so the KKK, a group of cowardly whites who truly took to heart the time their mama told them they're special. The first clan, as it's come to be known, was from 1865 till 1872 and was involved in voter intimidation through targeted violence against black leaders. The clan chapters at this time were totally independent of each other and highly secretive about membership and plans. And, you know, the white pointed hats and robes that we've all come to associate with the clan hiding their identities? Well, pre-1972, their costumes were actually colorful, and I like to imagine them being very floral, because in my mind, they're just old used drapes, and you'd know which house to stay away from, because there would be bare windows. That's just my satirical imagination, though. I don't care to get too much into the leadership behind the KKK, because I don't want to glorify the people behind the mask. I mean, if they were cowardly enough to do their crimes while hiding their identities, then I just think they should have been completely forgotten to history. Here are some of the key extremist reactionary positions that the group has held throughout its three iterations. White nationalism, anti-immigration, Nordicism, anti-Semitism, anti-Catholicism, prohibition, right-wing populism, anti-communism, homophobia, anti-atheism, and Islamophobia. Basically, they're scared of and hate anyone who is not a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. They're a bunch of fucking wasps, and they're about as intelligent as the insect itself. So after the Civil War, the slave owners who suddenly lost their free labor could not afford to keep their plantations or farms going, and as northerners who became known as carpetbaggers began moving towards the south, looking to buy land for rock-bottom prices, as well as being elected to Congress from the south. Sixty men from the north, including educated freedmen and slaves who had escaped and returned after the war, were elected from the south to Congress. The majority of Republican governors in the South during Reconstruction were actually from the North. The KKK's first focus was on these carpetbaggers and scalawags, which were used to describe white Southerners who supported the Reconstruction of the South. The Enforcement Act of 1871, also known as the Ku Klux Klan Act, was passed by the U.S. government by the U.S. Congress and signed into law by President Ulysses S. Grant on April 20th, 1871. This was passed primarily to combat attacks upon the suffrage rights of black Americans. President Grant sent a request to Congress after receiving widespread reports of racial threats in the Deep South, particularly South Carolina. 
The legislation was passed within one month of his request. Under the Klan Act, federal troops rather than state militias were used to enforce the law and Klansmen were prosecuted in federal court where juries were sometimes predominantly black. These efforts were so successful in the end that the Klan was destroyed throughout the former Confederacy after only six years and wouldn't be seen again for four and a half decades. Okay, so... If the KKK was essentially put to rest in 1872-ish, then where the fuck did it come from again, and how did it get its claws into Canada exactly? The second part of the question is easiest, so we'll get it out of the way now. Canada is racist. The 1910 Immigration Act, an order which, quote, barred from Canada any any immigrants belonging to the Negro race, which is deemed unsuitable to the climate and requirements of Canada, unquote. In 1915, in St. John, New Brunswick, all restaurants and theatres were closed to black patrons. Venerable Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, expelled 15 black medical students in 1918 after military hospital soldiers and patients in the community objected to receiving care from black students. The Hamilton police proposed Chinese Canadians should adopt reasonable names to help with identity checks, which were demanded in targeted racist attacks. In Edmonton in 1924, the city commissioner tried to ban black Edmontonians from all parks and swimming pools. That one was just 100 years ago. And we aren't just racist, we're anti-Semitic too. Jewish people were effectively barred from jobs within the city of Toronto and the provincial government, banks and department stores, as well as careers in medicine, engineering and education. And there were signs in and around Toronto stating, quote, no entrance for Jews, or Jews and dogs not allowed, or Gentiles only, end quote. And we all know about the past systems and the reservations and the residential schools targeting Turtle Island's Indigenous peoples. We have been bigoted since well before the beginning of our confederation, and we will be bigoted until we colonizers can collectively get our heads out of our asses and realize it really wasn't that long ago, as much as we love to say it was. That's a topic that could derail this whole conversation, this whole episode, so I'm going to put a pin in it there and continue on. So, on to the first part of the question... Where exactly did the Klan come from then in 1915? Does the movie title The Birth of a Nation ring any bells? It was a silent film from 1915 and a completely fictional account. It's basically an overly dramatized account of the origins of the KKK and many of those dramatic effects went on to be used in the second Klan in the 20s and on, such as cross burning and the white robes. Black characters portrayed in the film are white men in blackface, unsurprisingly, and they're portrayed as unintelligent and sexually aggressive towards white women. The KKK is the hero of the story, upholding white American values and maintaining white supremacy. Terrific. The film was the first ever to be screened in the White House, viewed by President Woodrow Wilson, his family, and members of his cabinet. The Hollywood opening of The Birth of a Nation in early February 1915 was accompanied with all the luster you could expect. Ushers were dressed as Confederate soldiers, usherettes as Southern Bells, and actors decked out in white robes and hoods stood silent guard on horseback outside the theater. However, the Atlanta opening 10 months later in the heart of the old Confederacy was a whole different story. On the margins of the film's opening in Atlanta, a wannabe businessman put together a business plan. Benefiting from the rampant racism racism, and riding on the coattails of the film, a man named William Simmons decided to restart the Ku Klux Klan. To do this, he organized a cross-burning on Stone Mountain, a landmark of the Confederacy overlooking Atlanta. But this wasn't just a disease spreading south of the border. Canadians went nuts for this film. It showed across Canada for years. The first showing was in Toronto in September 1915 at the Royal Alexander Theatre on King Street before going on to be shown in Vancouver and Montreal before the later fall of 1915. 
The rail itself would have to be shipped across Canada, so as the rail made its way along the rail line, each new city with a cinema was able to have a viewing for their white residents. And with people lining up around the block for a chance to see the film that was billed as the eighth wonder of the world. The film was so popular, in fact, that by Christmas Day 1915, a second run was already opened in Toronto, with the same happening in Vancouver and other theatres across the country as the years progressed. By December 1917, just two years after the first ever viewing in Canada, the film was having its fifth run in Toronto. Protests by black Canadians obviously popped up where the film was set to have a viewing, but most of the time, these protests did nothing, unsurprisingly. A few weeks after the film first arrived in Toronto in 1915, a group of black Canadians lobbied the Premier of, of Ontario and members of the provincial legislature al against allowing the film to no avail. The Ontario Film Censure Board also refused to ban the film because there were, quote, no objectionable features from a national standpoint, end quote. In June 1918, a delegation of black residents in Calgary asked city officials to ban it before its fourth run in the city, but the city did nothing, nor did the Alberta Censor Board. The Ku Klux Klan itself first popped up as early as 1921, when Klegels ventured north of the border, seeking to sell memberships and regalia. The typical clan approach was to reach out with a local Orange Lodge. The pitch came to Orange Lodge members, or the meeting was held at the Orange, Orange Lodge Hall, or the message came via a lodge member inviting his brothers to a meeting. The Orange Lodge were extreme Protestants with a rabid loyalty to the British crown and robust hate of the Roman Catholic Church. The American Canadian border was extremely easy to cross at this time, so in New Brunswick, clan members from Maine came and went without much trouble at all. The presence of strong Orange Lodges proved to be a harbinger of Ku Klux Klan recruiting success. A decade after the first viewing in Canada, a Toronto-based Knights of Ku Klux Klan of Canada was formed by two Americans and a Canadian. Funnily enough, most claverns on either side of the border were dealing heavily with Klegels, skimming money off the top of membership fees, and then leaving the state, province, or country, and never being heard from again most times. Okay, so we're going to pause here because we've got some new vocabulary to learn. So, a clavern is a clubhouse, essentially, for a clanton. A clanton is the area of jurisdiction and quote, extended in all directions to a distance midway between the location of the clan and the nearest clan thereto, end quote. The chief officer of a clan is an exalted cyclops, and the subordinates are 12 terrors. Oh wait, it keeps getting better. This is only the local level, baby. Provinces are basically counties with a maximum of six provinces per realm. The provincial convention is the Clonverse, and their chief officer is a great titan, with the other officers being the seven furies. Realms, also known as states to us aliens, are led by the grand dragon of the realm, with the subordinates being the nine squires, and the realm convention is known as a clarero, which is taken from the Maori word for convention which is just too much. Why aren't you using Protestant words? Lastly, all of this, the realms, province, clans, all fall within the Invisible Empire. The commander-in-chief of the Invisible Empire is known as the Imperial Wizard, and he has a staff of 15 genii, and his convocation is known as, you guessed it, a clonvocation. I literally could not make this shit up if I tried. Now, special names weren't just reserved for the higher-ups in this organization, oh no. Each clan has its own set of officers. The Supreme Grand Wizard is the President, a Clalif is the Vice President, a Clocard is the Lecturer, Clud is a Chaplain, Clygrap is a Secretary, the Clabby is the Treasurer, the Clad is in charge of initiating new members, a Clarago 
is an inner guard, a Clexter is an outer guard, and Nighthawks are couriers. Jesus H. Christ. The cultural appropriation in those names is real. I also haven't mentioned it yet, but the KKK handbook is actually called the Quran, a portmanteau of clan and Quran. If all of that's not enough, their title had a prefix depending on exactly which level they were at. So imperial is used for the empire level, grand for the realm level, and great at the province level. For instance, an imperial clad would be the chaplain for the whole organization, a grand clad would be for the realm, great clad for a province, and simply clad for a local clavern. Now, not all of these were present at every level, and some only existed at others. The clad, clerogo, and clocard were not at the province level, and the clad was not included at the realm level. The classic, second vice president, and the consul, attorney, only existed at the imperial level. I mentioned Klegel or Klegels earlier. They're the recruiters and they handle membership for local clans. Citizens are clan members and aliens are non-members. The Imperial Wizards 15 Genii constituted his Imperial Clancilium, essentially the Supreme Advisory Board. A giant is an emeritus title, so the Imperial Giant for an ex-Imperial Wizard, Grand Giant for an ex-Grand Dragon, Great Giant for an ex-Great Titan, and Clan Giant for an ex-Exalted Cyclops. Holy fuck. Okay, so, another sidebar. The KKK was not just one huge organization, but instead a whole bunch of big organizations who just all used the same name. There were the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, which is where David Duke became Imperial Wizard. <clears throat> but there were also the White Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, who used the term Klongris. When David Duke took over as Imperial Wizard and set his eyes on politics in, like, the 70s, he dropped the title and adopted National Director instead, and switched the titles of the members to Page, Squire, Knight for different levels. It's all about the appearance. Which is a perfect segue into this song called Your Friendly Liberal Neighborhood Ku Klux Klan by the Chad Mitchell Trio. They were a vocal group from the 1960s who wrote satirical songs about current events like the Cold War, Vietnam War, and the KKK. I would play a part of it here, but I cannot get it to work. So I strongly suggest everyone go listen to it because it's quickly becoming one of my favorites. And I can only guess that they weren't welcome in certain venues. They've actually got a real, lot of really great songs that leftists will enjoy if you like folk music at all. Alrighty, well, we were talking about Klegel skimming money off the top and then splitting either when they were discovered or before. This happened in almost every single region that the KKK operated during the 1920s. The Ku Klux Klan Klegels, when left to their own devices, collecting substantial amounts of cash could not help them themselves, but skim cash, abscond with cash, or simply embezzle. And I think there is something, there is some sort of ironic justice that a fellow citizen is ripping them off when they're worried about black people, Jewish people, Asian people, Catholics, and everyone in between. Just beautiful. Maybe God is real. Okay, so I've got this excerpt from the book that I want to read. In Toronto, 1925, the weekend events began on Friday, August 7th in the west central part of Toronto at the Parkdale Assembly Hall. Late in the evening, a dozen or more cars packed with clan members in full regalia left the hall and headed downtown. Quote, the occupants of the car included both men and women. They had removed their hoods and the glow of the dome lights on their faces added to the strange sight as the sedans drove eastward along Queen Street, end quote. When the caravan reached the heart of the Jewish garment district, the cars turned north and then east along Bloor Street, one of the city's main thoroughfares. The route was no accident. The cavalcade was intended to intimidate the Jewish community clustered around Queen Street and Spadina Avenue. The parade caught pedestrians out for a walk to escape the heat by surprise, and many, Jews and Gentiles alike, were left uneasy. And then we, I have another excerpt here from 
BC. In British Columbia, the impact of the Klan, its ideas, and its violent and illegal methods of targeting individuals from racial minorities was evident in the startling illegal activities of a group of local officials, including provincial cabinet ministers and police. These events arose after the death of a young Scottish woman. On the morning of July 26, 1924, police received a call saying a young woman named Janet Smith had killed herself in the upscale Shaughnessy Heights neighborhood, part of the separate municipality of Point Grey, which was embedded inside the Vancouver city boundaries. Janet Smith was a Scottish-born nanny who looked after the child of Doreen and Frederick Lefebvre Baker, a wealthy Vancouver couple who had originally hired her in London before returning to the West Coast. Smith's personal life was the object of much speculation, with several boyfriends and a close relationship with Wong Foon Singh, a 27-year-old Chinese houseboy who also worked in the Baker's home. When Constable James Green answered the phone at the Point Green police station on the morning of July 26th, a man told him that Smith was lying dead beside her ironing board in the basement of the house. She had a bullet wound over her right eye and a 45 caliber revolver was on the floor. The only person in the house at the time of her death was apparently Wong Foon Singh, who told police he was peeling potatoes when he heard what he thought was a car backfiring. When he went to the basement, he found the nanny lying dead. The Point Grey police ruled the death a suicide, a finding that was confirmed by a coroner's inquest soon after. Death by, gun, by self-inflicted gunshot. The United Council of Scottish Societies sent telegrams to Provincial Attorney General Alexander Manson in Victoria calling for the case to be reopened. Local newspapers began printing stories about the casual nature of the police investigation and the haste of the coroner's verdict. Wong Foon Singh was seen by newspapers as the obvious culprit in the whole business. Public opinion needed to be satisfied. Janet Smith's body was exhumed in August and a second inquest held in September. After a week of colourful testimony, the coroner's jury brought back a verdict of death by murder. Political pressure mounted as the Scottish societies pushed for answers about the fate of the young woman, who was increasingly seen as a symbol of oppressed Scottish immigrants. That her possible killer was a Chinese man fueled the racial animosities that thrived across the region. Inflammatory media reporting on the case accelerated the popular rhetoric against the Chinese community. Attorney General Manson responded by appointing a special prosecutor to mount a full investigation into the case. The Scottish societies pressured local MLAs to sponsor legislation, quote, to prohibit employers from hiring white women and Orientals as servants in the same household, end quote. A bill to that effect was introduced in the provincial legislature in the fall of 1924. The Janet Smith case jumped back into the headlines in late March 1925 after several months of relative quiet in the Vancouver newspapers. A gang of men dressed in white clan-style robes showed up on March 20th at Frederick, Frederick Baker's house in Point Grey where Janet Smith had died the previous summer. Wong Foon Singh was still working for the Bakers. He greeted the supposed clansmen at the front door. They grabbed him, pulled him to a waiting car and drove away. He was not seen for the next six weeks. When he reappeared on nearby Main Marine Drive in May fir on May 1st, disoriented and obviously in, rush in rough shape, the Point Grey police promptly arrested him for the murder of Janet Smith. As it turned out, the Klansmen who took Singh away were actually off-duty Point Grey police officers and private detectives hired by the Scottish societies. The whole thing had been organized by the Point Grey Police Commission, led by the chair and mayor, James Patton. The commission paid private investigator Oscar Robinson of the Canadian Detective Bureau some $1,250, I can't even think what that would be today, for secret service work. Robinson recruited his son, William, a.k.a. Willie, and colleague Verity Norton to help with the kidnapping along with K.W. Wrightson, the wheelman in the getaway car. Singh was held in the attic of a house in the western reaches of Point Grey for six weeks, beaten, tortured, and interrogated about the Smith killing. Singh later repeatedly testified in preliminary hearings and sub subsequent trials that his captors interrogated him while wearing white robes, robes that officials considered evidence of clan involvement. Singh maintained his innocence in the Smith killing. 
His kidnappers finally decided to release him on Marine Drive, drove around the block, and then arrested him for murder in their official capacity as peace officers. Police Commissioners James Patton and H.P. McCranny, along with Special Prosecutor Malcolm Jackson and three past or current officers of the Scottish Society, were charged with organizing the kidnapping. Then it came to light that Attorney General Alexander Manson himself had known about the kidnapping from the beginning, but went along with it in the hope it would lead to a confession from Singh. As Patton, McCranny, and the rest were about to go to trial in December 1925, the Deputy Attorney General, William Carter, stayed the charges on the grounds that, quote, the matter has been fully ventilated as far as is possible, and no public good can come from further proceedings that are, in my opinion, a useless waste of public money and should be stayed, end quote. So, in the midst of all of this, the Ku Klux Klan made its formal arrival in Vancouver. The leaders acquired a prestigious address for their imperial palace in the upscale Shaughnessy Heights neighborhood. <clears throat> this manor served as the backdrop for the recruiting efforts that began in October 1925. An announcement circulated widely in Vancouver newspapers that had the RSVP details and blared loudly at the bottom... Quote, all genii, dragons, hydras, great titans, and furies, giants, exalted cyclops, and terrors will be present to meet under the kindly light of the fiery cross, which will illuminate the clavern, end quote. Several cars arrived during the evening, some from across the border, with the new arrivals giving the American salute to the flag, and then the old Roman salute, which today we know this as the Nazi salute, to the leaders. Now, this epidemic of hatred wasn't going unnoticed by good people. In November 1925, a Victoria-born doctor practicing medicine in Portland, Oregon, wrote a letter to the British Columbia Provincial Police Superintendent warning of one specific clan member who had arrived the month previous in Vancouver. He wrote, quote, Luther Powell is devoid of common decency and can do nothing but harm in the place of my birth. This rascal is well known in Oregon. This scheme is to try and get as much money as he can by organizing the Ku Klux Klan. They worked Oregon out, and when the field became too tame for them, now they seek their work of destruction in B.C., end quote. And these good people taking notice weren't just in B.C., in Ontario, a June 1926 editorial of the Arne Prior Chronicle included the following. Why such an organization whose very existence depends upon its success in keeping discord, animosity, and hatred alive in any community should find, its, should find any footing in Ontario at all would be hard to understand if we did not know that there is a certain element in any community which will be attracted to any such thing, no matter what it may be, and if we did not know that organizers and imperial wizards of the clan find Canadian dollars just as comfortable in their pockets as they have found millions of dollars in the United States. Basically, certain Ontarios were already predisposed to this level of hatred, and the one thing the clan doesn't discriminate against is cash. By 1926, the clan had established itself in New Brunswick, with at least 17 claverns across the tiny province. This was aided by Jim Lord, a New Brunswick Conservative Party member who had been recently elected to the provincial legislature. An astute orator, he used his political position to help further clan activities and membership. Jim Lord made little effort to keep his clan membership secret and would describe himself variably as either the Imperial Scribe for the Frederick Clan or the Imperial Clalif for the Ku Klux Klan of Canada. The Imperial Klegel at a clan convention in, Tor in Ontario took credit for Jim Lord's successful campaign, stating, quote, The clan takes an active part in politics. Look what we did in New Brunswick, end quote. So we're going to talk a minute here about Moose Jaw. Growing up in Saskatchewan, we took a field trip to Moose Jaw for the day to go through the tunnels. If you haven't been to Moose Jaw or you don't know about these tunnels, look them up. They're super cool. They're basically living museums showcasing the Chinese laundries of Saskatchewan and the Prohibition-era speakeasies and bootleggers. 
Moose Jaw is close enough to the North Dakota border that the pre-NASCAR stock cars filled with whiskey were able to make it to thirsty American customers. And of course, because of such indiscretions, such as Chinese businesses and alcohol consumption, Moose Jaw was the perfect target for the Klan. One thing I had never realized before all of this, though, even having visited these tunnels myself, is the reason Moose Jaw was the tub of Saskatchewan at this time was because travelers arrived in town via the Canadian Pacific Railway mainline from Toronto, Winnipeg, and Regina from the east, and Calgary and Vancouver from the west. The Sioux Line, direct from the Midwest Rail Hub in Chicago, met the CPR mainline in Moose Jaw, making the city a major junction point for continental train travel. This means all sorts of people pass through Moose Jaw in these years. Harvest laborers, newly arrived settlers, salesmen, investors, politicians, Canadians, Americans, citizens of the world. Moose Jaw became the Saskatchewan Klegel's biggest achievement, where he claimed to have signed up some 2,200 people out of a population of about 20,000, which, if the claim is true, is over 10% of the city's population. In the province entirely, the realistic membership numbers were approximately 25,000 out of a population of 900,000. This still represented a significant block of voters, however, and the Liberal Premier of Saskatchewan began to take notice of the Klan's growth. The RCMP Security Service took note of the Klan's arrival in Moose Jaw, but, quote, the local Mountie was instructed not to investigate since it was being covered by Regina, end quote. As it turns out, though, the reporting from Regina about the Klan was non-existent, as the RCMP Security Service was too busy focused on communists, socialists, and the like, who the RCMP believed posed the true threat to Canadian society. Not the Klan, but commie, socialists, and the like. In early December 1926, calls for a leadership conference that would choose an imperial wizard, quote, who must be a native-born British subject, end quote, as most clans under American leadership were fraught with embezzlement issues. The gathering was preceded by revelations about the organization's finances that helped close the door on any American-born member becoming the Imperial Wizard. Auditors reported that a Dr. Charles Lewis Fowler had received $3,670 in salary, which is $63,350 today, plus travel expenses of $1,145, which is $19,765 today. In 1926 alone, a tidy sum for the sales of memberships across the country. However, the year prior, 1925, he had an even more successful year, $5,785 in salary, which is $100,580 today, and just $760 in travel expenses, which is like $13,000 today. I think that business was ramping down because all the easy marks had already been made. For a long time, the identity of the head of the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan of Canada was kept a secret. Eventually, the name was leaked, though. Jim Lord, the New Brunswick Conservative MLA, was just more than National Secretary. He was the Imperial Wizard. In the summer of 1927, with the new national leadership in place, five new claverns were formed in Nova Scotia, which followed earlier cross burnings at Roman Catholic churches near Halifax. In Nova Scotia in particular, the secrecy required by the Klan was actually enacted, so the number of participants and activities were hidden from the historical record. The Ontario Klan's apparently never got the true memo of secrecy because in Kingston that same summer, a gathering of 25,000 people from across the province and upstate New York conglomerated for a cross burning. Quote, all white Gentile Protestants are cordially invited to be president, end quote, beckoned the advertisements in the local newspaper. 35 new members were initiated that day. In early September, a crowd of thousands watched a parade of some 200 fully robed clan members just south of London. 
The Klan made its second attempt to move into Manitoba when in October 1928, the Klegel from Moose Jaw would try to organize in Winnipeg. Manitoba, however, would re- would remain largely unwelcoming to the Ku Klux Klan for another half century, mostly due to the already strong Métis population and Louis Riel's legacy through the Manitoba Provisional Government. In January of 1930, in the the nearby Lake Ontario town of Oakville, approximately 75 Klan members in full regalia marched into the town and towards the house of Isabella Jones, a young white woman allegedly living with a black man, Ira Johnson. The Klan members set up a cross on Main Street and burned it down before proceeding to Isabel's house, putting her in a car and driving her to her parents' house. The same was done for Ira. Ira's parents were warned if he was caught with a white woman again, the Klan would be back to deal with him. Only one single perpetrator would be convicted in the end and served three months for his part in this terrorist act. In the end, it turned out that Ira Johnson, the black man in question, was actually of Indigenous ancestry and was a wounded soldier from the First World War. Ira and Isabel eventually wed, had three children, and continued to live quietly in Oakville for decades after this event. The Oakville incident discriminated just demonstrated just how impractical the robes and hoods were for the clan's violent activities. The hoods and robes drew a lot of attention and crowds forming meant witnesses watching what the clan was doing. The robes and hoods were hot, causing yellow sweat stains on the forehead and underarms, and because they were hot, wearers were more likely to remove them, which is what happened and how the perpetrator was able to be caught. If all that wasn't bad enough, the long hems collected mud, taking away from the pristine conditions of the regalia. Fucking idiots. Just a few months after the Oakville incident, in March 1930, four Albertan clansmen from Red Deer abducted a blacksmith by calling him late at night for an emergency welding job. However, when he arrived at his smithy in Lacombe, a small farm town midway between Red Deer and Edmonton, Fred Doberstein was grabbed by two of the men and shoved into their car. He was bound with rope from head to toe, beaten, clothes stripped off, and then hot tar poured over his legs and abdomen. Feathers were then thrown onto the tar. Fred reported one of the men saying, quote, We are the Ku Klux Klan. Leave on the first southbound train and never show your face in Lacombe again. If you do, we will kill you, end quote. Fred agreed, and the men left him in the bush, but he had no intention of leaving town. Instead, he went straight to the police. Now, why was Fred targeted? Most likely because he had a Jewish-sounding last name, Doberstein. When the case finally came to trial, only two of the perpetrators' charges had stuck, and they were given minimal fines. By January 1933, the Alberta Ku Klux Klan was seeing the beginning of its end. It started with the Imperial Wizards' New Year's Eve celebration on December 31st, 1932. That night, the leader of the Alberta KKK was drunk and drove his car into a snowbank. Unable to get it out, he left it there, damaged, and submitted a false insurance claim alleging thieves had stolen it. He ended up being sentenced to two months jail time at Fort Saskatchewan, where in the meantime, an Edmonton lawyer sued him for $26,000 for allegedly slandering him during a lecture the day after the car crash. Then, a few clan members got together and looked at the books and realized he'd been skimming money off the top. So, they went on to sue him as well. He, in turn, sued everybody back. All in all, the first iteration of the clan in Canada really died out during the Great Depression. Folks just couldn't afford to pay the $10 initial membership fee, which is $175 today, or the $3 quarterly fee, which is $55. There was no money to pay the 50 cent admissions fee, which is $8.75, to hear lectures on the evils of Catholicism. Another reason was because in 1933, Adolf Hitler came to power in Germany, and Jewish Canadians began to receive news from their European family of the persecution they were beginning to endure. This caused provincial and federal legislatures to address the open racism that had fueled the rise of the Ku Klux Klan in Canada. However, this doesn't mean racism 
ended in Canada that year. In fact, in 1937, a friend of Adrian Arcand, who I will be doing a deep dive on sometime, sorry, Adrian Arcand, decided to try his hand at politics and ran in the predominantly Jewish riding. He took to appearing in the streets wearing a swastika on his lapel and giving the Heil Hitler Nazi salute. As a Nazi sympathizer, he went on to be interned during the war. Four decades later, he would be an inspiration to a new generation of Canadian clansmen. The mood of menace was very real for the Canadian clans victims. Black people, Asian people, Jewish people, Roman Catholics. But history does not record widespread lynchings, arson, or violent beatings administered the same way the clown did in the USA. This is not to say we were any better, but instead the KKK benefited from Canada's already heavily bigoted society, where minorities were already marginalized and excluded from the full benefits of citizenship. Discrimination and institutional racism were embedded in Canadian society right from the start and did not rely on vigilante activities. As always, thank you for joining me today. I drop a new episode every Monday morning at midnight, so check back in next week to see what I'll be sharing with you then. So-Called Canada is in a fentanyl and mental health crisis right now. Please consider picking up a free naloxone kit at your local pharmacy and do not use alone. For any Indigenous listeners out there, the Hope for Wellness Helpline offers immediate culturally aware and trauma-informed help to all Indigenous people across Canada. It is available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, in English and French to offer immediate support and crisis intervention. While there are supports in Cree, Ojibwe, and Inuktitut, those are not available 24-7, so you may need to call in to find out the next time a language speaker will be available. Call the toll-free helpline at 1-855-242-3310 or connect to the online chat at www.hopeforwellness.ca. And there is also the Thunderbird Wellness app that provides access to Indigenous perspectives on health and wellness, including substance abuse and mental health. Now, not that Indigenous people can't use these next resources, but they do not advertise as culturally aware or trauma-informed. So for everyone else, if you must use a loan, please keep in mind that you can call 1-888-688-6677 to contact the National Overdose Response Services to access support while using and especially using a loan. And there is the Brave, B-R-A-V-E app with a use a loan timer that connects a paramedic with your location if you don't respond. For mental health support, you can contact 988 to get connected to a crisis responder. If you learned something new today, or if you just enjoyed this conversation, it'd be awesome if you'd click that button and follow along for next time. Or if you'd like to contact me with feedback, you can email me at oursharedpodcast at gmail.com. See you next time.